Well, last week we started a new series titled The Unstoppable Church. It's based on Jesus' words to Peter in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, which says, I will build my church. This is Jesus speaking. I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. What Jesus was saying was that his church will be unstoppable. Nothing would be able to stand against it. Nothing would be able to keep it from growing. That describes the church that we read about in the book of Acts. The early church jumped from 120 believers to 3,120 believers in one night. That's church growth. But that was only the beginning. The church continued to expand and grow within a couple of decades. There were pockets of believers in almost every country of the civilized world. In spite of persecution and all-out attacks against the church, it continued to grow. It seemed like the more opposition the church faced, the faster it grew. And by the 3rd century AD, the church had infiltrated the government and top officials had been converted. Wouldn't you like to see that happen again? When Constantine became emperor of Rome in the early part of the 4th century, he spent most of his reign establishing Christianity as the official religion for the world, because Rome was basically in charge of the known world at that time. And he began to give away land and buildings to the church. He actually said, here, here's a piece of land, the government owns it, but it's yours, build something on it. Or he gave palaces that, that had been built for the emperors of Rome and said, here, you can have this to, um, to build a church in or to house your, your workers or whatever you want to do. He gave them places where they could meet permanently and not have to be meeting just from place to place and wherever they could happen to find a place to put a few people. Now, you would think that would have been a good thing, but it wasn't long after Christianity became the world religion that it began to decline. It had been growing when it was persecuted, when there were attacks out against the church, it was expanding. But now that it's sanctioned and now that it's actually given places to meet, the church started to decline. If you just want to count bodies, I suppose there was growth because the church did have growth in numbers of people, but as far as spirituality is concerned, as far as true converts are concerned, the church began to decline because it became something that people just did. If you're part of the world, you just become part of the church, and everybody was, and they started you know, simplifying the requirements to be a part of it because they wanted everybody to join. They even started borrowing customs and traditions from other pagan religions because if we're going to be the world religion, we've got to make everybody comfortable. So here, we'll take this from your religion and we'll take this from your religion and we'll borrow this tradition and we'll borrow this holiday and we'll bring them all in so that everybody can be part of this one thing. Christianity is cool. Now, we've made some compromises to make it that way, but it's cool. You want to be a part of this because everybody else is part of this. The church began to look much different than the church that we read about in the book of Acts. Instead of something that people joined because they wanted to be part of something, they wanted to be part of making a difference, they joined simply because it was the thing that you do. The church began to add programs to reach more people. Now, programs in themselves aren't wrong, but programs don't save people. Programs don't change anybody. A program without the power of God attached to it is simply that, a program. The early church, the church that Jesus left, wasn't a program. It wasn't a club. It wasn't just something we do so we can get together with other people that are like us and just have a fuzzy feeling. The church that Jesus left was a movement. I looked up movement, the definition of movement, to see what, what a movement is. A movement, the word movement, and of course there's a verb version, movement, you know, we all move. Okay, that's the verb. But movement is a noun. It is the act or process of changing a situation or event, or of changing the way that something happens or is done. The second definition of that is a group of people with a particular set of aims. You put those together, a movement is a group of people that come together with the same goal, with the same priority. We are coming together because 
the other definition. We want to change the way things are. We want to change society. We want to change the world. That's what Jesus left. He left us as agents of change and said, go and make disciples. Go and preach the gospel. They came together so that they could get trained, so that they could get equipped, so that they could get encouraged, so that then they could go out and do what Jesus had commanded them to do. They were a movement, not simply an institution, not simply a place to get together. We were singing that last song we sang this morning. And part of the song said, there's no place else I'd rather be. We just kept repeating it. There's no place else I'd rather be than here with you. There's no place else I'd rather be than here with you. And that's great. We love to come to this place. For a lot of us, this is probably the highlight of our week. I just can't wait to go back to church. I can't wait to fellowship with with the, the other believers again. I just love to be in God's house. But you know what? The chorus of that song said, set a fire down in my soul. That fire is there to get us to go back out. We come in to get regenerized. Regenerized, I guess that's the word. We come in to, to get fired up, to get more of the Holy Spirit. That's what fire represents the Bible, is the Holy Spirit. This is where we get filled up. It's like the filling station, the gas station. And you go out and you drive all week, your tank, tank gets empty. And if it completely runs out, you're going to stop moving. So we come back in just to get the new fire so that we can go out and begin to do what God wants us to do again. The church had a, early church had a mission that was given them by Jesus. They shared a common goal, which was to share the gospel with every person they met. That was the goal. We are going to share the gospel with every person. The goal wasn't just to make it to next Sunday so we can meet with other people again. It was, we are going to share the gospel, but we're going to come together to get trained, equipped, encouraged, Their hope was that by sharing the gospel, people would accept Christ. And that by accepting Christ, their life would also be changed, the people they shared Christ with. And those people that they had just shared Christ with would join the mission, would become part of the movement. Everything the early church did was about mission. When they gathered together, it was for encouragement and training so they could be better at fulfilling the mission. People didn't pick a church because of its style. Or the programs it has to offer. You know, the, I get calls all the time. Hey, we're just checking out church. We're kind of looking for a new home. We want to know, do you have this? Do you have that? What do you do for this age group? What do you do for that age group? They want to know, is this a church where I'm going to get something? Is this church going to benefit me? Well, yes, it will benefit you. Because you're going to learn about the mission and what you're supposed to be doing. And we're going to help equip you to go out and do it. Ephesians says, that's my job as a pastor. Not just to coddle the people, not just to give them what they want, but my job is to equip them to go out and do the mission. That's why we come when we start looking at a church, because it's, what can I get? If we're not looking to get the right things, the training and the equipping, we're looking for the wrong thing. We're not no longer looking for the church of Jesus Christ. We're looking for a country club. We're looking for a bunch of people that we can get together and just have a good time with. That's not the way Jesus designed his church. In the early church, the book of Acts, people didn't pick a church because of its style or the programs it had to offer. Every true church, and I say that because there were untrue churches back then too, every true church had the same purpose. Reach more people with the gospel. That was the only thing that drove them. How can we bring more people into the kingdom? How can we reach people? Now it seems like many churches aren't even focused on reaching the lost. They want more people, but they want people that already think like they do. Our main goal is to make our church exciting enough that the people we have now will want to keep coming and not go somewhere else that has better programs. So if that church has a program, we better have that program too. Otherwise, our people may go over there to join that program. Or we want to attract, also attract some people from somewhere else that doesn't have the program. Hey, you know, that church across town doesn't do this, so maybe if we offer this, maybe somebody will leave that church, and they'll come to our church. That's not church growth. That's church transfer. That's not the way the church is supposed to grow. The church is supposed to grow by people accepting Christ and coming into the kingdom. When it comes right down to it, there's only one thing that we can offer. 
that really makes a difference. Not that any of those other things are wrong, but there's only one thing that we can offer that makes a difference, and that's Jesus Christ. Are we offering Christ? Are we telling people about Christ? If we fail to do that, it doesn't matter how many great programs we have. It doesn't matter what style of music we have or what our dress code is. None of those things matter if people are not having the opportunity to meet Jesus Christ. I attended a workshop at a conference a couple of years ago. It was actually one of our network conferences, and there was a class that was, that was taught by a gentleman. He was, I don't know if at the time or if he still is or not, but he had at least at one time been a professor at Northwest University, our Assemblies of God Bible College in Kirkland, Washington. He was a professor, and while he was there, he decided to do so. I'm not sure if he was working on a master's or, or a doctorate or something and doing it for that. I don't, I don't remember that part of it. But he, he, for several years, he decided he was going to visit 100 churches. And he was going to evaluate these churches, most of them AG churches. I'm not sure if they were all AG churches or not. But he was going to evaluate these churches on certain criteria. And so he went to the service, and he had this scorecard that he would score these churches on. And he he had different things. He would count how many times the name Jesus was mentioned in the service, whether it be through songs or through the message or in some way something. And I don't remember all the other things, but he had these certain things that he scored the churches on. And he said out of one hundred churches that he visited. Only two of them even mentioned the name Jesus one time throughout the service. That was song time, message time, in the bulletin. I mean, he looked at every way. Only two churches out of a hundred even mentioned the name Jesus. He said they had exciting songs, but the songs weren't really about Jesus. They had great motivational messages, usually how-to messages, how to have a better life, how to have more joy. Well, let me tell you something. You can't have a better life, and you can't truly have joy unless you have Jesus in the equation. Out of 100 churches, only two even mentioned Jesus. Are they really churches? Can we really be a church without mentioning the name of Jesus? It's simply a club where we go and we feel good and we say, we don't have to worry about the evil out there because we're protected in these four walls. As I said last week, the church has for the most part ceased to be a movement and has become an institution. We come because it makes us feel good or we come because we like the atmosphere or we like the people or we like the style. If the church changes its style or we're no longer getting what we want, what we were coming for, then we go look for another church that's going to give us what we want. When really the only thing we should be seeking is something that every church should have. Unfortunately, they don't. We should be simply looking for a church that is going to help us become better at fulfilling the mission and one that's going to challenge us to fulfill the mission and one that's going to scold us a little bit if we're not fulfilling the mission. Because if we're not fulfilling the mission, we really aren't a church. We're a club. We've forgotten that the church Jesus built was not designed to be about us. It wasn't designed to make us comfortable. It was designed to motivate and train us to get in the game and to be a force of change in the world. It was designed to push back the forces of darkness, not hide from them. And we talked about that a little last week. What we're looking for in a church isn't what Jesus looks for in a church. And just to get a little heavy in here right now, so just to lighten things up a little bit, um, I thought I'd show in this little video clip here. A brand new show, Church Hunters. When we're looking for a church, what are we looking for? Are we looking for what Jesus would look for? Or are we looking for something that's going to cater to what we think we want? The only thing that matters to Jesus is are we joining in his mission? Are we part of the movement to change the world? There are churches all over America with state-of-the-art facilities, contemporary programs, great speakers, and slick catchphrases that everyone remembers. But if Christ were to visit those churches on a Sunday morning, I think he would be disappointed in what he sees because those churches are lacking the one thing that he told his followers they needed. 
primarily Jesus. I already mentioned that. A lot of churches don't even mention the name of Jesus on Sunday morning. But there's something else that I think is missing in most of our churches today. Even those that denominationally claim they believe in this. And we'll get there in a minute. Some of you are already ahead of me. Jesus has spent three and a half years training his disciples to do ministry. They knew how to do it. They learned from the best. He showed them this is how it's done. They saw him do it. But he told them there was one thing they were still lacking if they really wanted to fulfill the mission that he had for them. In Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, he said, do not leave Jerusalem. This is after he had already given them the Great Commission. He had already said, go make disciples. But he said, don't do it yet because you're not ready. You don't have something that you need. If you're really going to do it, see, just the command doesn't cut it. Just the instructions, just the training doesn't cut it. There's something else that's necessary if we're really going to be the church that Jesus called us to be. He said, do not leave. Wait for the gift my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then if we jump up to verse 8, he says... You will receive, everybody say, power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. He had already told them to be witnesses. But he said when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you will be witnesses. There's no way you cannot be a witness when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit makes you a witness. And the number one thing I think is missing in most of our churches today is the power of the Holy Spirit. You can search the whole country and bring in the best speaker to preach on Sunday mornings, and you can all go home and you can say, wow, wasn't that great? Man, he knows the Greek. He knows the Hebrew. Man, he just has a way of making the scriptures come to life. He's got that, that humor along with the serious. No, man, he's an awesome speaker. But those words are going to mean absolutely nothing and do absolutely nothing unless they come with the power of the Holy Spirit. We must have the Holy Spirit, to do what God's called us to do. And as I was thinking about this, because I've been talking about how the church stopped being a movement and just simply became an institution, I thought, why? Maybe it's because they didn't feel a need for the Holy Spirit anymore. See, when they were being persecuted, they felt they needed the Holy Spirit. But now that it's easy to be a Christian, we can do it in our own strength now. We can figure it out. We can take the classes. We can, we can do this in our own strength. We no longer need the Holy Spirit. But when we lose the Holy Spirit, we lose the power. We lose the sense of mission. We forget why we're there in the first place. Jesus had already given the command to go into the world, make disciples. He had already promised that the church he built would be unstoppable. That's after he said to Peter, my, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. He had already said that. But then he said, you've got to wait for the Holy Spirit because the unstoppable church is driven by the Holy Spirit. He said, don't even attempt to be a church. Don't even attempt to try to win the lost. Until you have the missing ingredient, you need the Holy Spirit. And I am convinced that even if we do and say all the right things, even if we made the perfect facility that would attract people to a building, not that that's wrong, but it would mean absolutely nothing unless we are driven by the Holy Spirit. You can build a big church in our terms without the Holy Spirit. You can fill it with bodies, have exciting programs without the Holy Spirit. Programs, charisma, excitement, all those things will bring in a crowd. But Jesus wasn't just interested in building a crowd. He wasn't just interested in being able to brag that he had the biggest church in America or the biggest church in the world. 
He wanted an army of people that would become a movement and work together to change the world. That's how he sees the church. Francis Chan, in his book, The Forgotten God, says, The world is not moved by love or actions that are of human creation. Now, let me stop right there, because out on our wall, we have love God, love people, share Christ. That is still our mission. That's what we're supposed to do. But you know what? We can manufacture love on our own. We can love somebody because we're told we have to love, but people will see right through that fake kind of love. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, it becomes a genuine love. We're no longer saying, oh, man, I guess I got to love people because Pastor Jerry said that's what we're supposed to do. We're not loving them out of obligation anymore. We're loving them out of who we are because the Holy Spirit has taken over who we are, and it flows naturally from our being. He says, the world is not moved by love or actions that are of human creation. The church is not empowered to live differently from any other gathering of people without the Holy Spirit. But when believers live in the power of the Spirit, the evidence in their lives is supernatural. The church cannot help but be different. And the world cannot help but notice. When we're driven by the Holy Spirit, people notice that there's something different. And sometimes they're attracted to it, sometimes they're repelled to it, but at least they're noticing. When's the last time somebody in the world noticed that there was something different about you? If they haven't noticed there's something different, it's probably because there isn't. And that's not the way we should be as believers. Even with the best intentions, I believe the church is powerless without the working of the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself needed the Holy Spirit. Oh, no, he didn't. He was God. He didn't need anything. He was self-sufficient. No. I dare you to read through the four Gospels this week. Make a note of how many times the Holy Spirit is mentioned as Jesus did his ministry here on earth. Jesus did not do ministry alone. Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, did ministry through the power that the Holy Spirit gave him. Let me just give you a few of them. I'm going to give you some just from the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, and John have some too, and Luke has additional. I'm just going to give you a few of them from the book of Luke. Luke chapter 4, 1 says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by who? By the Spirit into the wilderness. Jesus didn't just decide, oh, I think I'll go into the wilderness now. The Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness. And then after he spent time in the wilderness, we jump down to verse 14 of Luke chapter 4. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit led him to the wilderness. The Spirit led him back. And the Spirit told him where to go. Is he going to go to Jerusalem? Is he going to go to Bethlehem? Is he, where's he going to go? The Holy Spirit led him from the wilderness back to his next assignment. So the Holy Spirit led him. The Holy Spirit also spoke through him. Luke 10, 21, we read, At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things, et cetera, et cetera, okay? But it was Jesus through the joy of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave him those words to speak. He didn't make up that prayer off the top of his head. The Holy Spirit prayed through him. Jesus himself said that it was the Holy Spirit that called and anointed him. Luke chapter 4, verse 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He, the Holy Spirit, has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free. Jesus said, Everything I'm doing is because the Holy Spirit has called me to do it. The Holy Spirit has ordained me to do it. The Holy Spirit has given me the power to do it. What we just read was actually a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy by Isaiah about the Messiah. In Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 2, it says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. From his roots a branch will bear fruit. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. 
the spirit of wisdom, of understanding, the spirit of counsel, and of might, the spirit of the knowledge and fear of the Lord. It's talking about the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And it said his knowledge, his understanding, all those things that he will have will be because the Holy Spirit will be upon his life. If Jesus needed the Holy Spirit to do what he did when he was here on earth, how do we think we can accomplish the mission without him? If Jesus needed it, we need it so much more. Jesus said, my church will be unstoppable. And the reason it will be unstoppable is because my church will be filled, will be powered by the Holy Spirit. When we read through the book of Acts, we read about all of the amazing things that were done by the early church. We say, man, I wish I could have lived in those days. I wish I could have experienced all those things. I wish I could have been a part of that. Did Jesus stop working after the apostles died? Or did we simply stop doing what they were doing? Or stop believing what they believed in? It wasn't because they had great knowledge. Some of them did. Paul was a very learned man. But some of them were just common fishermen, had no knowledge at all. It wasn't because they were great in their own right. Some of them weren't even great speakers until the Holy Spirit got a hold of their lives, and then they preached some of the best sermons ever, ever preached. It wasn't their strength. It was the power and strength that the Holy Spirit gave them. That's why Jesus said, don't try to do it on your own. None of us are good enough to do it on our own. We need the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, verse 8 says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them. And this is when he preached the, one of the greatest sermons ever preached. This is when 3,000 people in one day came to Christ. How many of you guys would like to stand up in a crowded stadium and preach and 3,000 people come to Christ? You know, no way, uh-uh, uh-uh, I, I would never do that. Remember, this is the same Peter who, who just a few weeks earlier couldn't even admit to a little servant girl that he even knew Jesus. She said, oh, you're one of his disciples. Jesus who? Never heard of the man. He couldn't stand up to a little girl, but now he's preaching to thousands and thousands of people. What was the difference? The Holy Spirit. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. Acts 4.31 says, After they prayed, the place where they was, were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Why did they speak the word of God boldly? Because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Some of you here are scared to death to talk to somebody about Jesus. That's because you're trying to do it in your own strength. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, you won't be afraid. You won't have to stop to think, how do I do this? Because the Bible says the Holy Spirit will speak through you. You won't even stop to say, is this something I should do or not? Because the Holy Spirit will just take over and he'll just do it. And you'll walk away and say, Wow, did that come out of my mouth? Yeah, it came out of your mouth, but it wasn't your words. It wasn't your boldness. It was the boldness of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 6, verse 10. Stephen, standing trial. They're, they're putting Stephen on trial because he had been preaching about Jesus. He had been preaching because of the Holy Spirit. And Stephen was not a learned man. He had never been to seminary or never even studied the Jewish laws and stuff. He was just a normal average man. And they're talking to him and why is he doing these things? But it says this, they, the accusers, could not stand up against the wisdom that the Spirit gave him as he spoke. It wasn't seminary. It was the Spirit that gave him the wisdom. And the wisest people in Jerusalem couldn't stand up against the wisdom that the Holy Spirit gave him. Acts 13.9 Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, and then it goes on to say what he said. You can go back to these scriptures later, but it was because he was full of the Holy Spirit that he had the words and he had the strength and the courage to speak because he had the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit gave them the words, not only the words, but also gave them the boldness, even those who had been natural chickens their whole lives, now they had a boldness because they had the Holy Spirit. 
the Holy Spirit also told them where to go. Remember we talked about Jesus, the Spirit led him into the wilderness and the Spirit led him back to Galilee. The Spirit was the one that told Jesus where to go. The Spirit did the same thing for the early church. Acts chapter 8, verse 29 says, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Acts eleven twelve. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with it. That's Peter talking. He was wondering, should I go or shouldn't I go? And the Holy Spirit said, no, you go. The Holy Spirit guided him. Acts 13, 2. While they were worshiping the Lord, the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So the Holy Spirit said, I want these two guys to go here and to do this. You need to set them aside. It wasn't a decision they made. The Holy Spirit said, this is what needs to happen. Acts 16, 7. When they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. I've always wondered, how did that actually work? They're trying to get in, and the Holy Spirit's standing there. Nope. Nope. You can't go in. Can't get past me. No, it's the Holy Spirit speaking. He's saying, no, this is the wrong place. I want to reach, kind of like your GPS in your car when you take a wrong turn. Redirecting redirecting. You're on the wrong course. Redirecting. Get back on course. Go the way you're supposed to go. The Holy Spirit would not allow them. The Holy Spirit redirect them. Acts 20, verse 22. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem. Paul had been warned that something bad was going to happen to him in Jerusalem. In fact, people even told him the Spirit had revealed to them that he was going to be bound in chains. He was going to be imprisoned if he went to Jerusalem. Please don't go to Jerusalem, Paul, because bad things are going to happen to you. But Paul said, I'm compelled by the Spirit. Yeah, I know something bad is going to happen. I'm not sure exactly what's going to happen, but the Holy Spirit is telling me that's where I need to go. See, the Holy Spirit, we want the Holy Spirit just to protect us, and he will. But a lot of times the Holy Spirit leads us somewhere that we would rather not go. The Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. Who wants to go to the wilderness? But not only the wilderness, the Holy Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted. Sometimes the Holy Spirit leads us to places that we would not go on our own because he has something for us to accomplish while we're there. But if we listen to the Holy Spirit and we let the Holy Spirit guide us, when we get there, the Holy Spirit will also give us whatever strength we need. He'll also give us whatever words we need. And when we leave, we're going to say, thank you, Holy Spirit, for making me do what I didn't want to do. Because if I hadn't done that, I wouldn't have been able to see the miracle that you performed through that. So the Spirit gave them boldness. The Spirit did the speaking. The Spirit told them where to go. And Paul himself said that the power behind his message didn't come from his great knowledge and his public speaking abilities. He did have great knowledge. He had studied all the Jewish traditions. He knew, at least from the Jewish end, he knew everything. He was one of the most learned men there was. But he says, that's not why I'm having great results. It's not my public speaking abilities. It's not my knowledge. He said, the reason I'm being successful, the reason people are coming to Christ is because my words have the anointing. They have the power of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. My message and my preaching We're not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. My words had power because they had the Holy Spirit in them. In the worldly way of thinking, churches today have everything they need to be successful. They have great facilities, at least compared to the rest of the world. I mean, even the dump of facilities here in America is better than the facilities they have in other parts of the world. They have the facilities, they have great programs, they have great preachers, yet as we learned last week, Christianity is losing ground, at least in America. Why? I believe it's because we're relying on the wrong things to make make us successful. We're We're taking our cues from the world instead of taking our cues from Jesus. The world says, build a great building, and they will come. Build a great program, and they will come. Build a great environment, and they will come. I think we should do our best in all those things. We should keep our facilities up. We should make things look nice. We should take pride in what we have. 
But those things in themselves will not build the unstoppable church that Jesus described. It might build a big church number-wise, but it's not going to be an unstoppable church. Those things by themselves lack power. doesn't mean we can't have those things, but we need the power behind those things. Jesus never said, go build a great building. For the first few centuries of church history, they didn't have any buildings. They met from place to place. They were a migrant church. He didn't say, go build a great building, go create some great programs, or go hire the best preachers you can find. In fact, Jesus very seldom called the best. He called people who knew nothing. And he said, allow me to speak through you. I don't want you to rely on your book knowledge. I want you to rely on me. I want to speak through you. Jesus said, don't do anything until you receive the power that only the Holy Spirit can give. Remember last week, for those of you who were here last week, when I said the fastest growing church in America right now is Wicca? And some of you go, oh, yeah, the church of Satan, Wicca. That is the fastest growing church in America today. Jesus said his, the gates of hell would not be able to stand against his church, and yet the church of Satan, the gates of hell are gaining ground on the church of America. So maybe the church of America isn't the church that Christ had in mind. Do you know why Wicca is the fastest growing church in America? Some studies have been done, and they've asked people who have converted to Wicca and have joined the Wiccan church. They said, why did this church attract you? With all these other religions, with all these other churches, all these other things, why did you pick this church? And overwhelmingly, a very high majority of those people said, I chose this because it promises power. The devil promises power. And the devil gives power power. We even read about it in the book of Acts. Sometimes when the evil sorcerers and stuff came against Paul or one of the apostles or something, the devil does have an amount of power. But you know what? God's power, the power of the Holy Spirit, is greater than any power that the devil can get. Maybe if our churches had more power, people would be attracted to us instead of being attracted to that. But the devil's out flaunting his power, and we're trying to have nothing to do with power because we're afraid of power. We think we'll be weird if we practice power. Don't let that in my church. Somebody might come in. They might not understand. We don't want that in our church. We need it if we're really going to be the church that God wants us to be. The devil promises and gives power to those who join his church. But unfortunately, that power is used for selfish or unwholesome purposes. But there is something about power that attracts people. If we go back to the Gospels and to the book of Acts, we see power in play. Why were people attracted to Jesus? Because of the power. They came because they wanted to see him feed the multitudes with a few loaves and fishes. They came because they heard about a blind man that he healed. They wanted to see it with their own eyes. They they came to him because a leper came and said, this man healed me. They said, I want to see that. I don't believe it. I want to see it for myself. They came to him because of the power, because of the miracles. But then while they were there, He got to share that he was the way, the truth, and the life. People were attracted because of the power, the miracles, which is a form of power. But then they got introduced to the real power, the apostles. What attracted people to the message the apostles had? Once again, it was signs and wonders. It was miracles. It was power. In Acts 4.30, after Peter and John had been released from prison, and there was a prayer meeting going on. They were praying uh, for them to be released, and they were released, and they came came back to the house, and they told everybody everything that happened, and and they had been um, actually told to not, after they were released, they they were told not to um, preach the gospel anymore. So, okay, you know, we're going to let you go this time, but, you know, you got to promise you're not going to do that again, because if you do that, then we're going to do worse things. You you may not get out of prison next time. You may have to spend the rest of your lives there. And Peter and John went back, and they they talked to the people, and they said, let's have another prayer meeting. But what did they pray? They didn't even pray, God, protect us from their evil schemes. They didn't pray that. They prayed. They said, give us boldness to preach the gospel. 
in spite of the opposition. Give us boldness. And then they said, after they said, give us boldness to preach, they said this in verse 30 of chapter 4. They said, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Why did they want the signs and wonders? Not just they say, look what I can do. I'm a great magician. They wanted it because they knew that's why people came. That's what what Paul said. He said, my message was confirmed through the demonstration of power. The power confirms the message that is being spoken. And oftentimes, that's the reason people come is to see that. But then once they're here, then we get to share Jesus Christ. He's the real message. They said, stretch for three and perform signs and wonders because they knew people would be attracted to those things. Miracles open people up to the gospel message. And it's after that prayer for boldness and the demonstration of miracles that we find the verse that we read earlier in Acts 4.31. It says, after they prayed for boldness and for signs and wonders, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. They didn't do it in their own strength. They did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me go back to the verse we started with, Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I want you to underline, if you have your Bibles there, underline the word will. You will receive power, and you will be my witnesses. He didn't say if you receive power, you might be a witness. He didn't even tell the disciples that we seek the wrong things as Pentecostals. You know, we come down and seek the Holy Spirit because we want the tongues or we want some other something. You know, I mean, I believe in that. I'm Pentecostal. I'm AG. I believe that signs is the initial evidence. But you know what? There's other evidences that are even better than that. I don't care how often you speak in tongues. If you're not boldly preaching the gospel message, you are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Now get mad at me if you want to. But I just read it. Jesus said, you will be my witnesses. You can't help yourself. And that's why I love that song we sang earlier about the fire. Fill me with a fire that I can't control. See, that's the reason too many of us don't allow ourselves to be filled with the Holy Spirit, because we want to be in control. Then when the Holy Spirit takes over, we're no longer in control. The Holy Spirit is in control. That's what I want. I want the Holy Spirit to be in control of my life, because I've already proved I can't do it on my own. I want a church full of people that aren't trying to do things in their own strength. They say, Holy Spirit, I need you. I'm giving up control. I want you to put a fire in my soul that I can't control. Burn out of control and let me ignite a fire in this whole world. When we're filled with the Holy Spirit, we will. Everybody say will. We will have power and we will be witnesses. You say, I don't want to be a witness. I'm scared to death. You won't be if you have the Holy Spirit. Stop worrying about what you can or cannot do or what you would like to or not like to do. Forget about that. Simply yield to the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit take over and all of a sudden it'll be a joy to be a witness. The Holy Spirit will start saying, go talk to that person. And you'll go and the Holy Spirit will speak to you and that person will come to get saved. You'll wow. Did I do that? No. The Holy Spirit did that. But you were the instrument that he used. I saw a bunch of t-shirts in Branson. We we went to Branson for for a week and saw a bunch of different t-shirts and t-shirt shops. And and, uh, one of the t-shirts I saw said, uh, said, all I need today is a little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. But I got to thinking about that. 
No, I've already got Jesus. We always say, I need more of Jesus. You know what? You don't need more of Jesus. If you've accepted Jesus into your heart, he's your Savior, you've got all of Jesus you need. You don't need more of Jesus. What you need is more of the Holy Spirit. But we're always saying, Jesus, help me. In fact, I even have to think about this. You know, when we're tempted to do something wrong, what do we say? We say, Jesus, help me. Jesus, give me strength. No, it's the Holy Spirit that gives you strength. There's another scripture, and we'll probably get into this next week because i got to stop. I'm running out of time here. But when you're walking by the Spirit, you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. If you're being tempted, just say, Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And when you get filled with the Holy Spirit, you will no longer have a desire to do those things because the Holy Spirit takes over. We're praying sometimes the wrong things. Instead of praying more of Jesus, we need to pray more of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't been filled, you need to pray to get filled. If you have been filled, you need to pray to get refilled. I'm fine, and I need to pray to get refilled about 10 times a day. Jesus, my thoughts are going where I don't want them to go. Jesus, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And as I pray that, immediately that old thought leaves, and my mind is filled with only good thoughts because the Holy Spirit filled me up. When the Holy Spirit fills me up, those other things have to go. There's only room for so much stuff in there. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses. I'm going to let the worship team lead us in a closing song. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you through the word that was spoken. Maybe there's someone here this morning, and this is kind of even over your heads because you haven't taken the first step. You've never even asked Jesus to come and be your Lord and Savior. That's the first step. I'd love to be able to introduce you to Jesus this morning. He's the real reason we're here because we want to introduce you to Jesus Christ. He can change your life. But I believe there's a bunch of other people here. You've already taken that first step. You've accepted Jesus, but you're really not doing anything for the kingdom because you're trying to do it in your own strength. You need to allow the Holy Spirit to come and fill you. Don't seek a sign. Simply seek power. Say, I want the power that the Holy Spirit gives. I want the power to be a witness. I want the power to speak with boldness. I want the power to stand up against temptation. I want the power to live a godly life. That's what the disciples wanted. Jesus didn't say, go until you receive tongues. He said, wait until you receive power. We need the power. I wrote down the words for this song. I just want to I'm trying, I'm trying to decide if I want to do it. We're a little over time. Will you give me just 30 more seconds? Charles Tillman in 1895 wrote a song which many of you will recognize the words. They were in an upper chamber. They were all with one accord. When the Holy Ghost descended, as was promised by the Lord. The chorus says, O oh Lord, send the power just now. O oh Lord, send the power just now. O oh Lord, send the power just now and baptize every one. Then there's a second verse. The third verse says this. Yes, this old time power was given to our fathers who were true. But this is promised to believers. And we all may have it too. The power the Holy Spirit gives didn't die off when the apostles died out. It's for us if we want it. But we have to seek it. So I'm going to say a quick prayer, and then I'm going to ask the worship team to lead us in the song, Holy Spirit. And let's make this our prayer. Holy Spirit, we're not going to be afraid of you. In fact, we're going to welcome you. Holy Spirit, we want you. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here in this place. But Holy Spirit, more importantly, you are welcome here in this place. You are welcome in my life. I need you because I cannot be the church you want me to be without your Holy Spirit power in my life. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would take these words, words not spoken by me, all that came out of my mouth, but words that I believe you laid on my heart 
through the Holy Spirit. And I pray now that you would anoint those words with the power, the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Let us take them to heart. Let us not be happy simply going through the motions any longer. Not us, not, don't let us be happy just going to church for the things that we like about it. But let us become the church that you want us to be by joining your mission, becoming part of your movement, by being filled with your Holy Spirit and allowing your power to work through us. 